I'm Sam. I'm with Vector Motorsports and this is our third video in our video series with Engine Builder Magazine. And today we're going to discuss fuel systems, fuel injectors, and other fuel components for your build. So these are a bunch of injectors right here. There's a low impedance and high impedance. On all of our applications we mostly stick with the high impedance stuff so that's what we're going to focus on. The, there's also a difference between the style. There's a short and a tall and depending on your car and the size of the fuel rail and the height of it and style type will have to depend on the injector itself but these range from 18 pounds per hour to 260 pounds per hour typically with what we use in our shop I know there's bigger race injectors that go way higher than that but I think the biggest one we use in the shop here is a, two, a 260 pound per hour or they're in cc's so you know those would be 2600 cc's pretty much there's also a variety of spacers and types so you can almost get them to fit anything you can see the different style spacers on these these are awesome injectors as well this is what we use in our shop they make a really good injector their customer service is great and they do a really good job cleaning and everything this is um a di injector right here stock out of a car we do di stuff but we don't really change the injectors much on those i just wanted you guys to see the difference in them so back to the injector sizes this, for example, is a 1700cc, this is a 2200, and this is a 2600. They all look the same. What is different is the internals. Also, be wary of your connectors. So there's a various amount of connectors and styles and types. They make different things, um, they make different connector adapters that you can use um, to put on your injector. Also, you can have a variety of different harnesses. This is an aftermarket Holley EFI harness. You can get them with different injector ends. There's EV6, EV1, that kind of style. So just make sure you select the right connector for your setup. And if you need to, you can have adapters. So when it comes to choosing the size injector for your application, you need to consider a bunch of different things. Is it naturally aspirated or are you going to put a power adder on? Nitrous, turbo, supercharger. Also, what kind of fuel are you running? If you're running 93 octane or race gas, or if you're running a higher volume fuel like E85 or C85, you need to make sure you have an injector that can handle that flow. E85 typically takes 33% more injector flow. So on most E85 builds with a power adder such as a supercharger, we recommend at least 1300s. You can get away with 1000s typically, but we like to at least have 13s. On a 93 supercharged car, it depends typically 85 pound per hour, sometimes 65. Again, it depends on the power range and what you're looking to do and the type of fuel. We always want to make sure when we're tuning, though, the injector is correct. You want to be under 80% injector duty cycle. You don't want to tap out these injectors and go to 100%. The injectors going to be wide open. The air fuel, the spray, it's all going to be kind of crazy and uncontrollable, and it's not as safe for the car. So typically, we try to overdo the injector in the fuel system to make sure we have the fuel. If you don't, you can run lean and burn the car down. It's not worth it. So now that we've talked about fuel injectors and sizing, you need to make sure that you have the right size fuel pump and adequate fuel system to feed the injectors. Otherwise, the injectors aren't going to be able to get all the fuel they need to do their job properly. This is a stock style fuel hat bucket out of a car. I believe it was a Trans Am or something like that. There's a fuel pump inside this. There's also normally a leveler on here. Fuel lines in and out. On upgrades, what you can typically do is you can either get a full replacement system that has like an anodized hat and a whole different setup like four innovations or air motive makes systems for it, where it's a whole drop-in style hat and bucket. Or you can swap out the pumps inside as long as there's proper room with a fuel pump like this. Specifically, this is a 525 pound per hour. Um, this is a stock one out of a charger, just so you can see the difference. There's a little bit of differences within the pump itself. Obviously, this flows a lot more. So you want to make sure you have the proper amount of fuel pump. Sometimes you need to have a dual pump or even a triple pump system in the car to feed the fuel and get the proper flow. So now that we talked about in-tank style setups, on these fuel bucket systems in tank, there's usually a sock 
it's a pre-filter to filter the fuel out. This is another example of a sock that goes on this pump. Like I said, it's just a... <laughs> it's upside down. It's not how it goes on there. It goes like this. <laughs> hey, it goes on a fuel pump, helps filter the fuel flow. So now we talked about intake pumps. There's also an option for external styles. So when you get up there and you need all the fuel flow or for like race applications, these are example of external fuel pumps. By Air Motive, this is a 5 gallon per minute. This is a 10 gallon per minute. Both these are brushless pumps, which are quieter, they're more efficient, and I personally like them better. This is what I run in my car. They're, these also have a really cool feature. They have TVS, which is like a varial speed control. So you can set it up on any sensor, let it map sensor, TPS, and you can control the speed of the pump. So at idle, it's on like 30%, and then when you go watt, it's on all of it. So you're not always maxing the pump out. So that's a neat feature with these that I really like. But these get mounted outside the tank. They also make the same ones you put in the tank. And some people like those because the fuel can keep them cooler. Most of the time on like race applications are outside the tank. There's also an inline filter pre and post, which is a filter, norm filter normally like 10 micron, 100 micron, depending on what fuel you run, you need to make sure you have the proper size fuel filter for that as well so you're not creating any restrictions. So no matter what system you have as far as a fuel pump, whether it's external or internal, the best way to do a proper fuel system in a car, especially with boost or aftermarket performance modifications, is with a regulator. Depending on the setup, if it's NA or boosted, we still like to put a boost referenced regulator in. You have three ports typically, sometimes more or less. You have a return, the inline, and for the regulator, you want the boost to increase the fuel pressure. Typically, it's one to one. That way, you can keep the same amount of pressure on top of the injector. So, if you have 10 pounds of boost, it'll add 10 pounds of fuel pressure to keep that constant. On the regulator, you can set the fuel pressure typically 39 to 40 psi with boosts and then one per one after that if you need more pressure to pay on the application a lot of cars like the new hellcats run at 55 to 60 psi plus boost na typically is a 45 psi it just depends on the system your fuel pump if you're maxing out your injector a way around that is to increase pressure it's not the right way but it'll get you by in a, a situation i wouldn't recommend that long term the other important thing is line size. You need the proper size feed line to come into the regulator or the rails, and you also really need a proper size return line. If those are too big or too small, you're going to have issues. So sometimes you'll see fuel spikes in pressure and you can't get it down. Sometimes that means the return line is too small. It depends on the application typically, but on my car, let's say, it's actually a dash 10 in and a dash 12 return. At our shop, we normally do dash 8 feed, dash 8 return. That's typically adequate for around up to 1,000 horsepower. We'll be fine. So just depending on the application, if it's just NA and a smaller motor, you can go even smaller than that. But typically our default is dash 8, give or take. Armex Blast Media, the industry's leading baking soda-based abrasive technology when non-destructive cleaning is critical. Learn more about our 12 different formulations for wet and dry blasting at armex.com. Now, continuing the talk about fuel line, there's a few different fuel lines. There's regular rubber, which this is for like a carburetor. We don't really use this. <coughs> there's also, this is AN line. Usually on a lot of systems, we'll run this type of AN line with AN fitting, for example, like this. And these are typically lined internally to handle ethanol. However, if you're running C85 or ethanol long term, normally these lines will last three to five years before they start to eat away at the rubber and you can actually start seeing stuff in your filter or stuff in your injectors, so they actually recommend to replace these. So what I prefer on fuel systems is PTFE line. It's stainless outer. It is not a normal rubber interior. They make stainless hose with rubber inside. This is not that. This is stainless. They make black coated options as well. Inside there's PTFE, which is a liner. These lines will last forever. You'll never have to change them as long as there's not a problem. You can run methanol 
C85, any of the corrosive fuels without having to worry about them degrading over time or anything like that. This is what I run in my car. We prefer to run these in most cars that we build, however, it's, it's a cost thing. They are more expensive, but they're much longer lasting. Now the fittings are going to change. For PTFE, you need to make sure you get a PTF fitting. I've had a lot of customers show up with the wrong fittings and the wrong lines and there's leaks. So a PTFE line, typically, there's different fittings like I said, but the most common one is one with the olive. I'm not going to show you how to put it in, but the olive basically crushes and the PTFE between the line and the stainless making the seal. On an AN line, you typically have an AN fitting which crushes the rubber in the AN line and that'll work fine. You don't use an olive. Again, there's other style fittings that you can use for these. Typically the line you buy will tell you recommend what brand and style fittings will work with that line specifically. So now based on the build, you can decide whether you want to run gas, pump gas, race gas, E85, C85. There's a couple things to know when you choose. If you're going to run E85, make sure you have the proper size injectors and fuel system. Also, if you get pump E85, they make different kinds of testers. You can test it, follow directions, but it'll show you what percentage. E85 typically is around 80% ethanol, supposed to be 85 Sometimes I've seen it as high as 90 out of the pump. I've seen it as low as 50 up here in Michigan in the pump. This matters because it does control timing. However, there's people that freak out if it's 78 instead of 80. That much of a difference isn't a super big deal as far as tuning. It's going to be close to the same anyway. A benefit of running 85 is you can actually add more timing to the car, especially with boost or high compression. It allows for a bigger tuning window and it does burn cooler. So there are advantages to it, however you are using 33% more, so be prepared to stop a lot and fill up. Another option we offer here at the shop, and I'm sure a lot of shops offer, is flex fuel tuning. Depending on the car, you can add a flex fuel sensor, which is this. You typically put this in the return line, if you have one, because you don't want to restrict the, free, the feed. This sensor can be wired into the GM PCM. We usually use this in a GM style car. You can basically modify the tune and tune the computer to the various percentages of alcohol. So you can go all the way down to 9% or less of regular of ethanol, regular gas, or as high as 90% plus of ethanol. And the tune will adjust the amount of fueling and the amount of spark that the car would require to run 93 or ethanol, which is a flex system. And it's a true flex system, and we have really good luck with that here. We have cars that can run on both. They run great either way. You'll get more timing with ethanol and a little bit less with race gas. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of wideband ethanol flex fuel. There's people that'll tune flex cars over a wideband, so like in a Mustang or a Hellcat. I personally don't like it. I don't think they can respond fast enough for the ethanol and the proper spark and I've actually seen engine damage as a result from other shops trying it. So just be careful. If you want a true flex fuel system, get a sensor. These sensors you can integrate into like a Holly EFI or Big Stuff or anything like that too and get a really cool flex tune. So if you can't find E85, you can throw 93 in it and be good to go. Another important thing is O2s. An O2 on your car reads oxygen. It reads the level of oxygen. Some people think it reads the level of fuel. It's air fuel ratio, but it's actually reading O2 oxygen. You want to make sure you have a good brand oxygen sensor because this is basically telling your ECM what to add or what to take out fueling wise in the tune. It's going to show rich, lean, stuff like that. You want these to oscillate in a typical, you know, style car. Do not mix these. I've seen people come in with like an off-brand sensor and a stock sensor and they read completely different. If you're going to change O2s, I recommend changing both on the primaries. Change both. Put the same brand in. We recommend the factory replacement, replacement brand. And save yourself a bunch of headache. Don't, you know, put junk in over $5 a, a sensor. So pay the extra money and get a good sensor because this is probably the most important part of the car. This sensor specifically is an NTK sensor. It can read um, O2 for methanol 
all the way up to regular gas. It's very flexible, very powerful, very expensive, but a very good sensor. So don't cheap out on these sensors. They're probably the most important thing you need on the car. We also like to run two O2s, one on each side of the header collector to get proper readings on both sides of the motor. You can see what's going on. So in conclusion, make sure you get a proper size injector for your build. Don't get too big, don't get too small. If you get too big, you'll have idle and other drivability issues. Get the right size, you want to stay under 80% injector duty cycle at watt. Get proper pumps to be able to feed these injectors. Dual, triple, external, whatever you need. Make sure the fuel flow is there. Also, proper lines, proper fittings, and basically just size it all up for what you're building, what you need, and put it together. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and we'll see you next time.